Real quick, I wanna thank this video's sponsor, which is Simply Safe. This week, I am pouring concrete countertops on pretty much every flat surface there is in my outdoor kitchen. There are two log boxes on either side of the fireplace, the hearth, the countertop, the bar top, the bar top's footrest, and the cap on all four of the posts. Whew, told you, that's a lot of surfaces. This is my first time tackling concrete countertops, but let me share my experience with you in case it's on your to-do list and my experience can be helpful. Now my situation is a little bit unique because you would typically make up your concrete form directly on top of your cabinets. However, my cabinets are delayed by a few weeks. So instead of halting progress, I decided to make up some sort of like temporary structure to act as the cabinets. It's tricky because this structure needs to be as flat and level as possible. I built this in sections so that once the cabinets come in, I'll be able to remove the structure bit by bit, then slip in the cabinets one at a time. Then because my cabinets come with adjustable feet, the countertop will remain in place where I pour it. Then I'll be able to butt the cabinets up to the bottom. The structure is made up of two by four arms with an OSB top. I use my crescent chalk line to pop lines on the sheet, then my Triton circular saw to cut them out. This got attached to the two by fours, which then got secured from the underside into the bar's wall framing. While I did my best to hold it flush to the back and the other sections already attached, Jacob crawled under to secure it. A speed square really comes in handy when trying to make sure two surfaces are flush to each other. Now, in order to make sure it's flat, instead of cutting each leg to the exact same, we measured each leg individually to compensate for any variation in the deck. So if you're a sane person and wait until you have cabinets, then this is where your job will start. First up, I needed to cut a sinkhole. I believe most things come with a paper template for tracing, but mine did not. So instead, I had to flip my sink over and place it on top of the OSB to trace. I traced the outside lip, but it's actually up against the sink basin itself that I need. So from there, I used a machina square set to the depth of the lip on my sink and traced an offset line. I did this by running the square along my line and using a pencil to trace the distance. It isn't exact, but it doesn't need to be. You just want a hole large enough for the basins to pass through, but small enough for the lip of the sink to catch. I grabbed my Triton jigsaw to cut this out. The unique handle orientation on this jigsaw is definitely my favorite over traditional style of a handle on the top. In this grip, I can easily apply forward pressure regardless of the direction I'm moving the saw in. After making the first pass, I would pop the sink in to test fit it. If it didn't sit all the way down, I would see where it was rubbing, then take a little bit more off until it fell in and sat flush to the top. Ta-da! Ta-da! Okay, now for the cement board. When you're pouring concrete countertops, you need first to create a bottom, which needs to be made up of some sort of cement board. The sink location needs to be transferred to this first. Since I already made a hole in the OSB, I crawled under and traced the opening, then cut it out. I did this off the deck just because it creates so much dust. I definitely recommend a good respirator. My personal favorite being the stealth mask one. Then also a good blade meant for cement. I'm using the Diablo diamond grip blade here, which had no problem chomping through this. Now it can be set back into place and secured down. Well, after you make sure it's in the correct orientation, it's pretty easy to tell when it's not. That makes much more sense. Once I got the entire top lined with cement board, I applied a line of tape at each one of the seams. This is self-adhesive tape that just requires some light pressure to hold it in place. On mine, because I want the front visible edge to be super straight, I left the boards long, then chose to cut it in place all at once. Alternatively, you could cut each board to length as you're placing it. I would take a measurement on the left and right, then pop a line to connect the two. I recommend the crescent chalk line, which has a locking feature so that you can easily apply pressure to the string to get a crisp straight line to follow. Next, I threw in a blade Diablo specifically makes for cutting fiber cement, then made the cut. You can't see from where you're at, but this Triton saw has a laser line which makes tracking on a line super easy. And yes, even though I'm wearing my stealth mask, Jacob thought it would be helpful to use the Greenworks blower to blow away any of the dust as I was making it. And this actually becomes a new standard on the job site anytime one of us makes a dusty cut. Okay, and that's the bottom of the form done. Now we need to move on to making the sides. 
There are several methods you can go about this, but I personally used a product made by Concrete Countertop Solutions. It's a plastic run that gets attached to your cement board to create the back and sidewalls of your concrete form. It's worth noting this comes in several profiles. Some are more decorative than others, but I went with the straight profile. In a box of forms, there are two options, some with the profile, which goes on any side you want an overhang, then some that are a flat run only. These are attached to any side you don't want an overhang, and I'll show you an example later. Honestly, to attach them, it's really straightforward and easy. You'll want to miter the corners at a 45. To get these to match perfectly, you can hold two pieces that have a square cut up to one another, then mark where the inside corners meet. This will save you from measuring and being slightly off. These runs come in eight foot spans, but are very easy to cut out of miter saw. I would cut both corner pieces before attaching, but to attach, you can run in small screws. I believe they're about five eighths of an inch long. It is really easy to strip them because of the cement board they're going into. So just be easy when driving them in. If you have a long run, you just butt the next one right up to the previous one and repeat. They make it very simple to not mess up. I just recommend pushing forward slightly when attaching to make sure it's seated all the way against your cabinets. Every seam will need to be taped together with some duct tape. So all the corners as well as butt joints where two spans splice together. And here is a level up option if you really want a pro install, if you have an overhang like I do on this corner. So instead of coming in here like this and having this just flat, you can cut a small little piece with a miter. Like that. That will wrap the overhang around to the backside, which looks super sharp. So that's all the edges on mine that I want the concrete overhanging my cabinets. For the back, where the concrete will meet the wall, a run of the flat section goes in. Again, just as easily by screwing down the bottom while making sure the top is resting against the wall. The only thing you need to know on this is when it runs into the overhang material, you can cut back a section on the bottom lip so that they don't interfere. Now I needed to prep for the hole for the faucet. I used a Diablo carbide teeth hole saw in the size of the concrete countertop solution accessory. It's a rubber plug that just requires you to drill a hole through the cement board, then plug it up. The top will protrude through the concrete slightly, leaving you a clear passage to insert the faucet later. So that's the bottom, the edges, the faucet. The last thing to form around is the sink. Real quick, I want to thank this video's sponsor, which is Simply Safe. Many of you know that I have used Simply Safe for my personal and my commercial shop security for a while now. It is incredibly effective, reliable home or shop security that will make sure your property is safe. You order it online or by phone, it's delivered right to your door and you set it up yourself in under an hour. I recently added a system to my house and I am so pleased with how much more effective and easier it is to use than systems I've had in my home in the past. Just as before, I found all of the devices to be very reliable, set up as a breeze, and they're very easy to use. I've got not only the security system installed, but the Simply Safe sensors to cover the windows, HD cameras inside and out. The door lock lets me grant access remotely and I can set up unique access codes so I can get alerted as to who is unlocking or locking the door. They even have extras like water and temperature sensors. There is a ton of value in having peace of mind knowing my home and shop properties are professionally monitored 24 seven. And if anything happens, they'll make sure the police are called. If you've been feeling worried about your security, then you don't have to wait another minute. Visit simplysafe.com slash April to learn more and take control of your security situation. Concrete Countertop Solutions sells a sink form as well. It's also plastic and adheres to the inside to create a lip for the concrete. It's important to get the height the same as the back and the front wall. In my case, it's an inch and a half. So you see me using a two by four as a spacer to make sure I'm setting it at the correct height as I go around. You can also see I just jump over the inside wall of my sink. You can use an assortment of tools, but my crescent shears make quick work of the plastic. When I got back around to the starting point, I again taped the seam with some tape. Now it's easiest if you have some foam, you can cut to size and plug the inside of your sink, but I didn't. So next I taped in some extra plastic. You, you basically just wanna protect the inside of your sink from getting concrete in it. And believe me, it will. Oh, and if you're wondering about the wood inside, on mine, the front section was curving in slightly and I didn't want my countertop to make this shape. 
So I grabbed some scraps and used them to push out the front so that it would be nice and straight. Once the form is in, now I tape around it so next I can caulk this seam. You can lay down a bead of caulking, then clean it up using your finger. Now, once you remove the tape, the form is clear and will create a smooth finish once you pour in concrete. So that's actually all of the forms finished, but now we need to add in what will actually give the concrete its strength once you pour it, and that is gonna be a wiring mesh material. Concrete is stronger when it has something to hold on to, to hold it together. In slabs, you see rebar, but in countertops, this mesh will act as the rebar. It comes in a roll and is easy to cut with a pair of scissors. To be effective, this mesh needs to be suspended in the middle of the countertop. So after rolling up the length needed, I started placing some standoffs, which is an accessory you can purchase and attach them easily to the mesh. It's a little tedious, but it is very easy to do. You wanna try and keep them spaced about 10 inches apart and on the same line. I placed them around the perimeter and a middle row first. Then I came back and placed two more rows that staggered those first three. This way, each section has a box and one in the middle, meaning that when you pour heavy concrete on it, the mesh will stay in the middle of the pour as it should. Once they were all placed, next I went to each one and secured it down to the cement board with a screw. Each stand comes with a hole in it to make this easy. Okay, so there's the countertop all formed up and ready to go. The exact same process was repeated at the fireplace so that both log boxes and the hearth were ready for concrete. And there's quite a bit of information on the pouring step. So let me hop back and forth between the next two days of footage to pass along as many tips as possible. First off, let's start with mixing. This mix comes in a whitish color, but note that there are tons of pigments you can choose from if you want something different. I picked a charcoal color for mine. You can change the color by changing how much you add to the mixture, but it's important you pick a number of scoops and stick with it so that all your batches come out the same. The pigment is first added to some water and mixed until the clumps are out. Then more water can be added so the concrete mixture can be mixed in. You definitely want a respirator to protect your lungs from the powder. The filters on my stealth mask protect down to a 0.03 micron, and I have a 10% off code if you're interested. I recommend using a metal mixing paddle over a rubber one, and also having a person on hand to slowly add in the concrete as you continuously mix. This makes it so that the drill doesn't get bogged down and to get all of the clumps out. These buckets are heavy. Waddle, waddle, waddle. I found that adopting a waddle walk was the fastest and easiest way to move them. Once it's mixed, you can just dump it directly on top of the mesh and then repeat. You most certainly want extra hands. Once you start mixing, the clock starts and it is a mad dash to get everything done before the mixture starts drying. After I poured a bucket, I would haul it back to my crew and use it to mix up the next round of pigment, then pass it to them as I took the next bucket ready to pour. Once you pour a bucket load in, you can use a trowel to spread it around. This stuff is self-leveling, so you can get it close and then it will slowly work its way down and out. I don't think I can put enough emphasis on this. Expect messy. I don't recommend mixing on your deck or in your kitchen because it will get everywhere. Lay down plastic around your pour area as you'll later see it will get coated. Not so much whenever you're pouring the bucket loads, but the next step is to screed it and that's when the mess happens. You wanna slightly overfill the form. Then you use a straight edge to span from back to front to level it perfectly to the top of the forms. You can buy a screed, but I always just use a straight edge from around the job site. You use a slight back and forth motion and move from one side of the form to the other. You'll see that the screed picks up the high spots as you move. This will also expose all of the low spots. After I make a first pass, I fill in the low spots, then do it again, letting all of the excess just roll over the sides. The long countertop was pretty tricky as the back form isn't enough to screed on. For this, I would span from the sink form to the edge, and this actually worked great. And it was also really handy on this larger surface. Jacob was finding all of the low spots and throwing in more concrete to fill them in for my next pass. Then immediately after you get it level, you need to go around the edges and vibrate it so that you get out the air bubbles. They make actual tools for this, but I personally just grab a sawzall, took out the blade and use it to hit all of the edges. And this works great. I've used a palm sander before in the past, but a sawzall has much heavier vibration and the large flat surface is easy to get up against the forms. 
And now at this point, you can take a short breather, clean up your tools, your buckets, and take stock of just how filthy you are. Hey, April, you've got, you got a little something on your legs and uh, your arms. Oh, and your face. <laughs> oh yeah, I got a little bit of something. But not too long because this stuff does settle quick. It's only about 30 minutes before you take a magnesium float to the surface and start smoothing it out. You'll get a feel for how much pressure to use as you do it. As you're gliding across the surface, you don't want the float completely flat or it'll just pull up the concrete. You wanna have a slight tilt to it. You will leave some marks behind at this point, but don't worry because the next step is to use a steel trowel, which will be the final step and remove the marks left by the magnesium. Oh, and something special I did right after the mag flow, but before the steel trowel was drop my logo into the heart. If you watched me build my shop, you'll know that I have my logo stamped in that concrete too. And now that sits for two days, which is pretty maddening. I could not wait to tear open the forms and see how it worked. In the meantime, I pulled up the plastic and blew the area clean so that I could have a good look at it all. That's unbelievable. This is actually coming along, isn't it? Obviously, there was plenty to do in two days to keep other things moving, but it's definitely exciting to rip off the first form. I used a putty knife to first drag along the inside, then simply pulled the front lip forward until it yeah. broke. Oh, it's so slick. This feels like glass. That's insane. Leaving behind a beautiful surface. I don't know what I was expecting, but it's unreal how the surface feels. It honestly feels like glass. If you take a close look, you can see where I missed a few air bubbles, so maybe vibrate yours a little more. But no huge voids at all. Just remember when you're working that this outside edge will be exposed in the end. So really work on the concrete, vibrate to get the air bubbles out, and for areas like around the sink where there is a caulk joint, you'll just wanna make sure that everything is clean. <sighs> what a ton of work. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's 100% worth it to me, but it is a lot of work. You can most certainly use these same steps to do concrete countertops in your house, in the kitchen, in the bathroom. I, I just think it's so awesome for such a simple material, how beautiful and how unique it turns out. Since my job had so many pores involved, all of the surfaces took about two weeks to do. If you have concrete countertops on your to-do list, then I'll leave you a link to Concrete Countertop Solutions as they have literally every product you need for this job. You can check the description for that as well as everything else I used in the video. Now let's fast forward three weeks when the cabinets arrived. Woohoo! Now the tricky part comes in, which is to move in the cabinets while moving out the temporary structure we built at the start of the video. I started by making the feet as low as they could go, then removing the back panel on the center cabinet so that it could be worked in around the sink basin. Remember that this structure was built in sections with this purpose in mind. So I first had to remove the support of that OSB and two by fours under the sink. Now, if everything works out, this should slip right in. Perfect. Now the back can be reattached with the screws it came with, then we repeated on the next two, except none of those panels had to come off. Again, I repeated by pulling up the screws, holding up the temporary support, then pushing in the cabinet. Once the cabinets were in place, now the feet could slowly be raised up until it was butted up to the bottom side of the concrete countertop. Of course, you can skip this entire step if you do things in order and wait for your cabinets to get in to pour your countertops. But I think that this was a pretty cool solution to keep the project moving along. For my choice in cabinets, I went with these durable and ultra low maintenance stainless steel cabinets made by Trex Outdoor Kitchens. Not only will they last forever, they actually come with a lifetime warranty, but they have awesome features like full extension glides, soft close hinges, and adjustable shelves. They also have dozens of styles and colors, but I went with Hampton Door Style in Covert Green. Now for my cabinets, I plan to house not only things like platters for the grill area, but also the head unit to my stereo system and a full rack of spices. For the spices, I'm using one of my favorite organizing systems called Smart Jars. You've probably seen me use this for my hardware in the shop as it's the perfect system for that as well. But they actually started off as a spice organizing company. I built a very simple slide out rack that I can mount on the inside of my cabinets. Then the Smart Jar system is made up of these docks that fit perfectly into any standard pegboard. 
Inside each one of these docks is a plastic container that you can either leave inside and grab what you need, or you can completely remove the plastic container and take it up to the countertop if you want. So when I'm grilling, I can grab whatever spices I might need and bring them up to the top. But then whenever I'm done, I can quickly clean the countertop off and have everything organized and ready to go for next time. I find the visibility perfect as all the containers are laid over on their side. But of course you could also add a label to the outside or the lid if you wanted to. With these being so versatile, I definitely recommend picking up a pack and putting it to use in your workshop, kitchen, craft room, or even kids room. Honestly, the options for these are limitless. Up next, I was gonna tease you and say this is what I'm doing next, but I can't even remember. But I have a whole list of things still to do in order to complete this awesome outdoor kitchen. So stay tuned if you're interested and check out the previous videos if you wanna get caught up to this point. Good luck on your concrete countertops and I'll see you on my next video. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Be sure to also check out my website because I sell lots of useful things, such as these fraction and decimal charts. They're not only cool shop decor, but they're also functional. If you're interested in getting yours, you can click right here.